Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the plenary session of the IAU Symposium 373, but resolving the rise and fall of star formation. Um, it's my honor to, before introducing the first speaker, I will remind everyone that after this session, there is the group photo. And also today, after the invited discourse at 6.30 in the afternoon, there's a second opportunity to take group photo. So it's my honor to introduce um, the first speaker, Professor Adam Leroy from the Ohio State University. Oh, um, Adam obtained his PhD from the Berkeley University of California in Berkeley. After that, he moved on to a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg. Where he was leading the highly influential Heracles survey. After that, he moved on to NRAO, where he was a Jansky Fellow and subsequently uh, took on a staff position. And after a couple of years there, he became faculty at Ohio State. Um, Adam is one of the leaders in the ISM studies and star formation in nearby galaxies, and he received this year the very prestigious Humboldt Research Award for his significant contributions to the field. And he'll give us an introduction about what is um, the latest in this area. So please, Adam, go ahead. <clears throat> So, hi, and thank you to everybody uh, who made it. Thank you very much to the organizers for this opportunity uh, and to the first day speakers and poster presenters in uh, the 373 uh, session, uh, uh, which has already been uh, fantastic. Um, so, I know it's early in the morning. I hope you've already had a bunch of coffee or at least some coffee. And my goal here is at least partially to try to keep you awake with plenty of pretty pictures of galaxies uh, for a few minutes here. Um, so. My goal is really to give you something between a taste and a summary of what we learn when we observe samples of local galaxies at high physical resolution across many wavelengths. Uh, and to do this, so my goal is to go over the basic idea, uh, give you some highlights of results from recent observations, tell you about some of the results that I think have emerged from the last few years uh, coming out of multiple groups, uh, and then finally say a few words about what I think key next steps are in this, uh, in this field. Um, but uh, I would rather show you a whole bunch of pretty pictures and plots than an outline, so let's just jump in. Um, and I'll, again, go very quickly here. So this symposium is about resolved studies of galaxy evolution. So for a lot of the unresolved work on distant galaxies, uh, you think about these kinds of plots, um, which I'm not going to dwell on, except to just say that at large scales, there are regular relationships between the star formation rate, the stellar mass, the molecular gas mass of galaxies. Uh, and a lot of galaxy evolution occurs in systems that obey these uh, fairly regular relations among these quantities for integrated properties of galaxies. Um, but what I'd like to focus on here is that behind and beneath these global relations within individual galaxies and driving a lot of galaxy growth is this violent star gas feedback cycle in which diffuse gas forms bound clouds, these clouds form stars, and then stellar feedback reshapes the interstellar medium, to some degree resets the cycle, and then the cycle proceeds. And the, this sort of violent gas star feedback cycle plays out far below the scales of an individual galaxy. You can reasonably think about this, although this is imperfect in some ways, about being organized into a collection of quanta of the star formation and feedback process. There are clouds of cold gas you can see on the left, H2 regions surrounding young stellar populations, and clusters and associations of stars. So these regions have size scales that are of order of parsec, up to 100 parsecs or so, so that with high enough resolution, you can observe galaxies and resolve them into these discrete units. And this isn't just a statement that you can do this. A major advance from the last 10 years has been that multiple observatories across the world on ground and in space have undertaken multiple surveys to try to resolve galaxies or large parts of galaxies into these individual units of the star formation gas feedback cycle. So this includes big efforts by ALMA, 
by VLT Muse and other optical telescopes, especially integral field units, by Hubble, and now uh, I'll show you, I showed you a picture at the very beginning and we'll show you a couple of pictures at the end. This includes the James Webb Space Telescope, among a number of other major facilities. So in a little bit more detail, ALMA, which remains an absolutely revolutionary instrument, even 10 years after we turned it on, uh, has obtained roughly one arc second resolution or about 100 parsec resolution in the nearby galaxy population, wide area, and in many cases even full galaxy maps of the molecular gas, which trace the mass and kinematics of molecular gas. Uh, so it, ALMA has obtained these kind of maps for about 100 nearby galaxies out to around the Virgo cluster. Uh, with major contributions, of course, coming from the FANGS ALMA program PI'd by our chair, uh, so maybe that'll buy me an extra minute or two. Um, and at the same time, a number of very ambitious programs have tried to push, especially targeting the centers of galaxies, uh, to even higher resolution, reaching 0.1 arc seconds, 0.5 arc seconds, translating to sort of 10 to a couple of tens of parsecs, and especially the Wisdom and NUGA surveys have been extremely influential in pushing us to this even higher physical resolution view towards the center of uh, select nearby galaxies. Uh, at the same time, our view of the ionized gas in galaxies has been absolutely revolutionized by the ability to obtain seeing limited, wide area, spectral maps of galaxies in the optical. And for the nearby galaxy population, the VLT, the MUSE instrument on VLT has clearly been a game changer here. So when you target this towards nearby galaxies, what you see is you break the galaxy apart into individual H2 regions, yielding a full optical spectra for each region and giving you information on the ionized photon production, star formation rate, dust, physical properties of the ionized gas, as well as the kinematics and underlying stellar population properties. This kind of view has been obtained for 20 to 30 full galaxies and towards many dozens more uh, regions of individual galaxies. So meanwhile, multiband Hubble imaging is able to resolve and characterize individual star clusters, individual stellar associations, which are the products of the star formation process uh, and play a number of other key roles in trying to understand the star formation gas feedback process. Uh, Hubble has carried out at least three major surveys since the wide field camera upgrade that give the properties of clusters and associations across a really diverse set of the nearby galaxy population. So Lagos targeting very local galaxies, Goals targeting merging infrared bright galaxies, and the FANGS HST survey has mapped out the clusters and associations for about 40 star forming main sequence galaxies in the nearby universe. So this hopefully gives you an idea of the kinds of observing programs that are going on to try to break apart galaxies into these sort of fundamental units of the star formation feedback process. What does this get you? So the short answer is lots, and there's a whole bunch of text on this slide which still does not do justice to the scientific richness of these sorts of data. Um, but a, a sort of incomplete but still slightly long answer here is that you get the demographics and environmental dependence of, the, of these sort of fundamental units of the star formation process. When you combine tracers of multiple stages of the star formation process observed in the same galaxy, you get insight into how individual regions evolve and especially how stellar feedback reshapes the interstellar medium. Uh, and from high, high resolution and high detail with a sort of full accounting of star formation and gas, we can compute the sort of key physical timescales and infer efficiencies of star cluster and cloud formation in galaxies. So I can't do justice to the full richness of these data, but what I, would, what I figured I would do is pick sort of three things that I think are highlights and that we've already heard some about already this week and, talk, and then talk a little bit about next steps. And so first, let me pick up on a theme that was especially raised uh, in a talk by Jai Sun yesterday, and I think we will hear more about today, which is that with 50 to 150 parsec resolution in a large set of galaxies, we can look at how the properties of the cold star forming molecular gas change from place to place and change from galaxy to galaxy. 
and they do change. So these are the simplest, these are sort of the simplest way to see this. These are just maps of the molecular gas surface density obtained by ALMA and maps of the line width for three galaxies on the same scale. So the stretch is the same for all of these galaxies. And it's simply immediately visible uh, that the properties of the molecular gas at these scales vary from galaxy to galaxy. Both the surface density and the line width increase here visibly as you go from a low mass spiral to a massive star forming galaxy and then to a strongly barred galaxy that has funneled a lot of gas to the center of the, uh, to, to, uh, to its center. And to look at this a little bit more quantitatively, this is the line width as a function of surface density for 70 local star forming galaxies populating the star forming main sequence. Each dot here is an independent sight line at 150 parsec scales. Uh, and although I'm showing the 150 parsec scale data, analyses of subsets of these data at 60, 90, or 120 parsec resolution yield substantially similar results. So what you see here are more than 100,000 independent measurements of regions that are the size of individual molecular clouds. And you see a large variation in both the surface density on the x-axis and the line width of molecular gas across the local galaxy population. Uh, and the sense is, if you look at the panel on the right, is that there is a big variation along an axis that corresponds to the rho v squared pressure in the molecular gas. And there is significant but uh, substantially smaller variation along the orthogonal axis that corresponds to whether gas is more or less gravitationally bound. And this gas isn't just varying in its properties, it's doing so systematically. So this takes these same plots and now colors, the prop colors these individual 150 parsec regions according to where we find them inside galaxies. So on the left, the galactocentric radius of the gas. On the right, the differentiating between the gas that is found in bar-driven galaxy centers and the disks of galaxies. And the point here is that I just want you to see that the gas properties are not just varying a lot, they vary systematically across the galaxy population as a function of where you find the gas and what galaxy you look at. There's many more details in a series of papers, including this year by Jason, referenced here on the, the bottom. Uh, and I've been highlighting and showing plots based largely on the FANGS ALMA survey, but I want to point out that this is, not a, this is not a uniquely FANGS result. This is now widely seen across multiple studies. I'm calling out here a couple of uh, very nice recent studies. So the first showing work by Nathan Bernetti and Christine Wilson, which shows uh, very distinct gas properties in mergers of galaxies and LURGs compared to normal disk galaxies and local group galaxies. And in the bottom, showing work by Fumi Agusa and collaborators, uh, demonstrating that when you break apart M83 into individual distinct environments and dynamical regions, the distributions of gas properties vary in a measurable quantitative way as you go from place to place uh, and region to region across M83. So what's going on here? Well, so one plausible answer is shown here. This is just showing that the internal rho v squared turbulent pressure in the molecular gas correlates well with the pressure that you would need to hold up the clouds and the disk of the galaxy combined in the full weight of the gas and the galactic potential. So what you're seeing here are points showing averages over individual one kiloparsec size regions in just under 30 galaxies. And so this is just saying that quantitatively, it appears that the clouds show an internal pressure, so this rho v squared term, that appears to reflect the structure of the disk around them uh, along with their own self-gravity. And so. Uh, we had a nice talk about this in the 373 symposium yesterday from Jai, uh, and we also had a very nice talk from Bruce Elmagreen pointing out you know, that the disk structure is correlated to a host of observables. And so this leads uh, fairly directly to this plot that Jai showed already very nicely yesterday, uh, which is that a whole host of cloud properties on the y-axis here, so these are all population averages of giant molecular cloud properties in kiloparsec size regions across the nearby galaxy population, these all correlate, these are correlation coefficients, uh, and these all correlate in a significant way with the properties of both the host galaxy and the region that you look inside the, uh, inside the host galaxy. So we're seeing cold gas coupling very directly to the environment that you study it in, which uh, may sound, you know, might sound obvious, of course, gas should care about the galaxy it lives in, but this is very much not the view of molecular clouds that we came into this decade with. Uh, and so this has been very exciting. And so before I shift to tell you quickly about a couple of other topics, I wanna to point out that it's not just the cloud scale gas properties, but it's also the qualitative and quantitative morphology 
of the gas disk that changes in response to the host galaxy. So I'm highlighting here a recent paper led by Tim Davis and the Wisdom Group uh, that I think we'll hear more about in Martin de Rowe's talk. Uh, so this shows that the centers of Wisdom and Fang's galaxies uh, have a CO morphology that when measured either quantitatively or just looked at visually, correlates directly with tracers of the stellar potential well and the star formation activity. So the sense is that early type galaxies with high stellar density often show smooth, low contrast gas disks. So we're also seeing the morphology of the carbon monoxide emission tracing the cold gas coupled to the host galaxy potential. So cloud scale gas demographics vary with host. They appear to couple to the host galaxy, to the region that you find them in inside of a galaxy. What else do we learn? So a key insight that we've also heard a fair amount about in the symposium so far, and we'll hear more about, uh, from heavily resolving galaxies in tracers that probe multiple phases of the star formation process, uh, is that you gain access to region evolution. So you see that very directly here in this beautiful plot from Catherine Kreckel on the left, which shows you young massive stars glowing in H alpha shown in gold, visibly separating from the molecular gas glowing in blue. So you can just see different stages of the star formation process, young massive stars and the cold gas that must have formed them appearing in different places once you resolve galaxies at high resolution. Uh, and if you believe that you're looking at a stochastic evolving population, you can take the statistics of these different types of regions, their frequency, their properties, and try to use this to reconstruct a life cycle of the molecular gas. And this was very nicely explained yesterday in the talk on M33 by Konishi and collaborators. Uh, and it was applied early to the large, uh, the large Magellanic Cloud uh, by Kawamura and collaborators, but has turned into a major industry over the last few years. And so we heard yesterday from Xi'an Pan about making a detailed statistical characterization of the relative amounts of H alpha bright and CO bright and both bright regions in a large set of galaxies at about 100 parsec resolution. Uh, so here, as in the sort of region classification approach, you see about the same number of CO bright, H alpha bright, and both bright regions within a factor of a few inside local galaxies. So since we know roughly how long H alpha glows for uh, in a stellar population, this implies that, uh, that massive stars are separating from or dispersing the molecular gas on timescales that are comparable to the ionizing photon production timescale of a single stellar population or a cluster, which is relatively fast. And we'll hear from Jayon Kim tomorrow uh, about another really important version of this kind of measurements, which is fitting model life cycles to the flux ratio bias and progressively bigger apertures centered on H alpha and CO peaks. And Jayon's new paper has fit models like this and made the measurements to fit them to 54 galaxies, which is a huge explosion in the number of, uh, in the number of these sorts of measurements that have been made before. Uh, and similar to the other measurements that I talked about, uh, uh, this paper demonstrates a very fast time to clear the cloud once molecular gas or to reshape the interstellar medium once star formation appears coincident with the molecular gas and a pretty fast lifetime for CO to have, star, have massive star formation onset. One of the very exciting things that I want to call out here though is that with a large population of galaxies in the panel on the bottom right, you can start to see how these time scales correlate with the environment that you attempt to derive them in. You can, so you can try to see how this region evolution depends on location in the galaxy and on host galaxy. And we also heard a very good talk in the session yesterday by Sarah Jefferson going over this kind of uh, measurement in simulations. I've shown a bunch of H alpha, but it's also very important to emphasize that this isn't just an H alpha result. There have been multiple demonstrations of this sort of effect of separation of young stellar populations uh, and molecular clouds using clusters and associations from both the FANGS HST survey and the LEGAS survey. So um, showing work here on the left from Katie Grasso's thesis work using LEGAS, and on the right from a paper led by Jordan Turner and Danny Dale, which Danny showed a very nice poster on uh, yesterday. And what both of these, so without going into great detail, what both of these show is that uh, as you look at progressively older cluster populations, because you could age date the clusters, you see a separation between the molecular clouds that must have given birth to the clusters and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the clusters, such that the youngest, uh, the youngest clusters appear associated with molecular clouds, but this correlation dissolves on timescales of order 10 mega years. So again, things appear to be evolving very quickly. And the statement here would be that stellar feedback appears to reshape the ISM, leading us to see molecular clouds, H2 regions, and sort of 
all but the youngest clusters in somewhat different locations after 10, 10-ish mega years. And so assuming statistical cycling and assigning some stellar-based timescales to this, this appears to happen fast with the onset of star formation and the separation between massive stars and cold gas happening on timescales of sort of one to 20-ish mega years. But what about the star formation itself? So another thing which has maybe been a little less appreciated is that access to this very high resolution multi-tracer view gets, also allows you to calculate or at least estimate the uh, critical timescales that many people have invoked as uh, the relevant timescales for star formation and cloud evolution in theories of galaxies or molecular cloud or star formation in molecular clouds. So these are things like the free fall time, the crossing time, the shearing and orbital times, uh, and this feedback cycling time that we dis just discussed. So you, you want to be able to estimate all of these, but estimating most of these requires a high resolution and often multi-wavelength view of the, uh, of the galaxy structure. And so if you get this high resolution view, you can estimate these timescales, and then by contrasting these timescales with the observed ratio of gas to star formation, to the star formation rate, over a part of a galaxy, you can estimate the fraction of gas converted to stars per timescales or estimate the efficiency rel relative to each of these critical timescales. And I'll show you two quick slides on these efficiency calculations. So first, I wanna explicitly call out results on the gravitational freefall time because this has been viewed as a central timescale to many theories of star formation but it requires an estimate of the gas volume density, which is very hard to pin down observationally from low resolution data. So with high resolution CO imaging across many nearby galaxies, especially from FANGs, we're able to estimate the free fall time and contrast this with the star formation rate and the total gas mass in, bar in parts of galaxies. And this lets you estimate the distribution of efficiency per free fall time now in thousands of regions across the nearby galaxy populations. This is showing you results for 20-ish uh, FANGS galaxies, the first, the first set of observations. Uh, and the results here imply that about 0.7 or under a percent of the gas is converted to stars per gravitational free fall time, which is in good agreement with much more restricted uh, observations from uh, earlier sort of Milky Way work or from indirect estimates. Uh, so the statement here would be that star formation rapidly reshapes the gas, but it's highly inefficient. Uh, and this isn't just true if you pick the gravitational free fall time. This is a more general version of this plot from Jai Sun's recent paper. And it shows that this is a statement that applies to not just the free fall time, but the crossing time, the feedback cycling time, and even the shearing time, the orbital time scale, or estimates of the cloud collision time scale. So in all cases, if you contrast the red bar that you see, which shows you the gas consumption time, the time to convert all of the gas into stars based on the star formation rate and the gas mass, you see that the estimated physical timescales, which are shown in these histograms or in the gold bar, are all far to the left of the gas consumption time. So this implies that only in the case of the free fall time, crossing time, or the, this feedback cycling time, only order a percent of the material is being converted from gas into stars per relevant physical timescale, which we now have these precise estimates of. Or if you look at the orbital timescale, uh, or the putative cloud collision times or sharing time scales, it's more like five or 10% of the gas, but in all cases, very inefficient. So let me close with a few remarks on where we go next. I've shown you that these types of observations show us that cold gas couples to the galaxy, that we're able to actually observe region evolution and this sort of feedback reshaping the interstellar medium in action, and that we're able to calculate efficiencies relevant, and relevant to a number of, uh, a number of key timescales. But there is still a lot to do, and I wanna call out three areas. So first, I absolutely believe we have to push this extragalactic work to much higher physical resolution. With 10 parsec resolution, instead of 100 parsec resolution, we can resolve GMCs, we can map out filamentary structure, and we would be able to look at external galaxies and make direct connections to the kind of Gaia-based work that we heard about from Catherine Zucker and collaborators, and has been so revolutionary in mapping out the interstellar medium of the Milky Way over the last few years. This is just demonstrating quantitatively using a plot on the bottom from Katie Grush's thesis and showing the sort of Fang's view of a nearby galaxy where we do have the very high physical resolution. And you can see that the jump from 100 parsec resolution to 10 parsec resolution is just a qualitative leap in how things actually look in terms of detail. 
This is doable for ALMA, and if you focus this power on the nearest galaxies, you can do this with ALMA and get the other phases of the star formation process because seeing limited observations of things like H-alpha also achieve this high physical resolution. I think this is a huge next direction for these multi-wavelength studies to push to very high physical resolution, and the best way to do this is the closest galaxies. So as we heard from Irwin and Barbara and a number of folks yesterday, it turns out most of the gas in galaxies is actually not the molecular gas we're talking about here. It's atomic. And so one of the other major directions that we're going to be going in over the next 10 years is to apply this high-resolution view to atomic gas. Right now, we can only do this in the absolute closest galaxies. So we have big efforts with the VLA to do this in Andromeda and the local group dwarf galaxies right now. But doing this across the full nearby galaxy population is a reason to build the square kilometer array and the next generation very large array. So this is going to be a major way that we sort of revolutionize our view of the nearby galaxy population to study the individual uh, clouds of atomic gas across the galaxy population with these next generation uh, radio instruments. But for now, we're getting an amazing view of the local group of galaxies from the VLA targeting the northern targets and from ASCAP, and especially this absolutely amazing gas cap survey targeting the Magellanic Clouds in the south, showing here the SMC at a resolution we've never seen it at before from work by Naomi McClure Griffiths. Uh, and this is extending across the, both the Milky Way and the Large Magellanic Cloud. And then closing, uh, you know, the, the really incredible new view that we're getting came three weeks ago when the James Webb Space Telescope started delivering mid-infrared images of nearby galaxies. So these images, in addition to just looking absolutely beautiful, give us insight into both the star formation, the star formation activity in a galaxy, and they give us, uh, and I think this came as a surprise to a number of folks, an absolutely stunning view of the structure of the interstellar medium and galaxies. But what you're actually looking at is kind of complicated. It's the glow of small dust grains and PAHs illuminated by the stellar populations, so that there is radiative transfer, dust to, the dust to gas ratio, the PAH abundance, uh, and the heating sources involved here. So it's very clear that we have an incredibly powerful new view of the interstellar medium and star formation in galaxies from the JWST data, uh, but also that one of the big next steps over the next six months, over the next years, is going to be making the most of this absolutely fantastic opportunity. So since Ava is walking up, I will finish there, show my outline again, and say thank you very much for showing up so early in the morning, and I'm super happy to either take questions or talk about this at the coffee break. Thank you very much for this very nice overview of the state of the field and the insights gained. Um, are there questions in the audience? If, if so, please step up to one of the microphones. Okay, uh, Jim Koda, Stony Brook University, the, the USA. Uh, so thank you very much for the very nice review. And I agree that you know, it's fantastic that we are in this era of resolving 100 per second uh, scales. At the same time, I, I want to make sure that uh, 100 parsec is not enough to resolve the fundamental unit of star formation because the typical diameter of molecular clouds in the Milky Way is 40 parsecs, not 100 parsecs. And if we misunderstand this, then you know, the physical parameters we are measuring uh, can be misinterpreted. For example, the free fall time you mentioned is calculated based on cloud and the surrounding area average. And that's you know, different from the free fall time we think of, you know, cloud uh, structure collapse, and that's the free fall time we want to think of, but 100 parsec resolution, you know, we cannot get that. So as I'm saying this, uh, not to criticize uh, the talk, but I just want to make sure that the community understands that what we are talking about is not really the fundamental unit of star formation. So um, I agree with you. <laughs> um, is there a question or? Well, it's a comment and question. Okay. Uh, so I would say, you know, I attempted to show that yeah. as we push, you know, I attempted to show in the last set of slides here that as we push the resolution down to lower and lower resolution, we're able to see. You know, I think that our view of the, oops, ah, I think I'm not positive um, we're going to be able to show this again. Just, just answer. Yeah. So I think that our view improves dramatically as we head to 10 parsecs. 
what I would say in response a little bit is that 40 parsecs is not magic. We want resolution. We gained an enormous insight by pushing to 100 parsecs, which does show us the mean density at a scale of interest comparable to the scale height and the turbulent driving scale. I think 10 parsecs is a really good thing to aim for next. I, you know, I do not actually think the evidence that 40 parsecs is a magic scale is in the data at the moment. But I think that pushing towards 10 parsecs will let us connect to Milky Way studies. And the question is, what can you latch onto in terms of comparisons and physical insights? So I would say, I totally agree with you. We should push to 10 parsec resolution. And I hope Alma will, you know, I hope the Alma attack, you know, which is all of you, will hear this and be generous coming forward. Uh, so I absolutely agree with this uh, as a next step. We can't stop here. It would be heartbreaking if we stopped here. Yeah, I agree with that. OK, um, one final short question. Uh, hi, thank you, uh, Adam. Great talk. Uh, Martin Buell, uh, Oxford, by the way. Um, I was hoping you could go back to your slide, but in I, the slide, I think, from I think Jay, it's not possible. <laughs> yeah, sorry. In the slide from Jay's paper on the, you know, the properties of you know, 150 parsec regions uh, in different parts of galaxies, you obviously had that the centers of galaxies are higher surface densities. But actually, I was interested in your deep purple color. You showed that in the outer parts of galaxies, you actually had regions that had as high uh, surface densities as the centers. And I was wondering if you could comment on those. You know, what are those clouds? What are these regions? And so on. Um, so I, I do not think that we have regions that are pushing towards 1,000 solar masses per square parsec at, 100, uh, at a 100 parsec resolution in the outer parts of galaxies. So there are some, high, there are some you know, pushing 100 or a few tens. Uh, at things like the bar, you know, the ends of bars or hot spots in spiral arms. But the most extreme regions across the sample are absolutely in the centers of galaxies, right? So I, I think there are external extreme regions driven by dynamical effects in galaxies, but galaxy centers take the cake in terms of the places you find the absolute highest gas surface density and line width. Does that make sense? Um, unfortunately, we have to move on. For the talks, um, if you would like to have questions, post them either in the Slack of the 373 or um, try to catch Adam. So thank you very much again. <laughs> we'll move on to our next speaker. It's my pleasure to welcome Annalisa Pilipic um, from the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg. Um, Annalisa obtained her PhD at the ETH in Zurich. Then she moved on to with a Swiss um, a fellowship from the Swiss National Science Foundation to work at the UC Santa Cruz. After that, she took on a postdoctoral fellow position working with Lars Hernquist in the Illustrious project. And then we were lucky enough to convince her to come to Heidelberg. Uh, she's been a group leader since and a staff member. And Elisa is the leader of the TNG, um, Illustrious TNG 50 survey, where she has been, um, yeah, I was checking if you could bring up the slides already, that would be great, where she has been, um, that she's leading with, together with um, Dylan Nelson. And for that, she also, they have been both awarded the Golden Spike Award for that. So today, she will present us results from all this effort. And also, it's really great that she's been here because she's one of the up and coming leaders in this really exciting field of cosmological simulations. Annalisa, please. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Yes, we are gonna uh, talk about uh, star formation, but actually it's decline and quenching from a theoretical perspective. In fact, from a cosmological numerical simulation perspective, as the movie uh, suggests. Here, you're seeing uh, the evolution of a galaxy that by ratio zero will be a little less massive than our own Milky Way. It's a, it's a galaxy from a simulation we call TNG 50. In the center, you're seeing uh, gas density, on the bottom right, they are zoom in view of the center of this object in stellar light and gas density. On the left panels, you're seeing the large structure around these objects. Earlier on, it was in their matter column density and now in gas density. This movie is meant to highlight three concepts. First of all, the galaxies are not isolated. They accrete satellites. They merge with smaller objects or they merge into more massive galaxies. Second, they can accrete gas from cosmological distances, either from satellites or from the circumgalactic medium around them, or directly from the large-scale structure. 
and three, they can also get rid of their gas, as you may see at some point, some outflows of gas that may be powered by energy injections, either driven by supernova explosions or supermassive black hole feedback. Now, this TNG-50 is a cosmological magneto-hydrodynamical simulation of galaxies. What does this mean? Well, in the context of galaxies, the numerical community is really progressing on two complementary tracks. On the one hand, people simulate idealized or isolated disks or individual galaxies in a full cosmological context, but still one simulation, one main galaxy. As the one shown here, the images span something like a few tens of kiloparsecs, and the numerical resolution of the simulation can be as good as one parsec. On the other hand, since a few years, it has been possible to simulate galaxies in so-called large volume cosmological simulations. These are the ones we will be using in this talk, so uh, watch out. So these simulations follow the coevolution of colder matter, gas, stars, supermassive black holes, and in some projects, magnetic fields, from initial conditions that are consistent statistically with the measurements of the cosmic microwave background, all the way to ratio zero, where the dark matter forms the backbone with, of, of the universe, a cosmic web of filaments, sheets, voids, and halos. But gas permeates everything. And in the spatial scale of one pixel in this image, these simulations actually realize resolved galaxies and also follow the coupled nonlinear processes across spatial scales. So that phenomena that happens within the central region of galaxies can actually affect the surrounding dark matter and gaseous halos, or even the large scale structure, and vice versa, the large scale structure, say the cosmological gas accretion satellites, mergers, and more generally hierarchical growth of structure can affect galaxies. So this is done essentially by solving the coupled equations of gravity and hydrodynamics in the expanding universe, which in turn are coupled to numerical equations or uh, recipes that mimic star formation, cooling and heating of the gas, chemical enrichment, stellar feedback, or feedback from supermassive black holes. So this is done in the simulations we will be talking about, actually at the scale of the kiloparsec, or at best on average 100, 150 parsec in uh, the star forming region of galaxies in the simulations I mentioned before, TNG 50. So we are actually talking about larger scales and complementary scales with respect to the ones discussed with Adam. So cosmological scales. Simulations of this type are Eagle, Illustris, Horizon AGN, Magneticum from 2014-2015. But more recently also Simba and Illustris TNG. They all come with different implementations of the galaxy formation physics of relevance for these topics. Star formation is quite crude. Gas, typically above a certain density threshold, is simply converted into stellar particles. And stellar particles represent mono-age stellar populations of, say, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, or even 10 to the 6 solar masses. So because we're going to use it, I'm going to um, focus, uh, I'm going to give you some more details about the last TNG that I collect and developed together with my colleagues around the world listed here. So, TNG stands for the next generation illustrious. It followed on the successives of the original illustrious simulations of 2014, and it now comprises three boxes, the aforementioned TNG 50, TNG 100, and TNG 300. Larger volumes mean larger statistics, more galaxies. Smaller volumes means that we could afford better resolution. If you want to remember just one thing or three things about TNG that's set apart from other simulations uh, projects is that it's based on the Arepo code, which is a moving mesh code for the solution of hydrodynamics. It includes magnetic fields, and it has a combination of volume and resolution that remains unmatched. We're talking about something like 30 billions among cells, gas cells, and particles. So this was possible thanks to a rather substantial computational and development efforts. So to give you an idea, TNG50, which is the smallest in volume, but really the mightiest of the simulations, took something like 130 million CPU hours. So 16,000 cores of Hazel Hen in Stuttgart worked 24-7 for one year. So this is not something you can do every year. 
But such a large calculation gives us an enormous dynamical range and an enormous information content, both on large scales, as I mentioned earlier, as well as sub-galactic sub scales. Here is, again, a large scale structure of the universe from TNG50, but now you are seeing it in the gas. And the color denote the mass weighted average of the Mach numbers in hydroshocks. You may notice the gravitational collapse shocks along filaments or shocks due to feedback. These are a few tens of the thousands of galaxies in TNG50, since in stellar-like composite as if observed with the Hubble Space Telescope, including radiative transfer impulse processing, so you can see dust lanes and the effects of dust on stellar light. More TNG galaxies, Redshift 2, only star forming, F is on edge on. On the left, it's age alpha luminosity. On the right, is a, is a stellar-like composite in three JWST near CAM uh, bands. But what about more um, exotic wavelength? X-ray is pretty exotic for the galaxy community. And here I'm showing you X-ray maps of TNG50 galaxies. These simulations naturally return many Milky Way-like galaxies that also exhibit X-ray coherent shells or cocoons or bubbles above and below their disks, similar in morphology to the one that has been seen by Irosita, the X-ray telescope, in our own Milky Way. But as mentioned earlier, galaxies are not just isolated. Actually, the majority of them live in dense environments, like in groups of 10 to the 13 or 10 to the 14 total solar mass in total mass. This is one of them. You see it depicted in mass-weighted gas temperature, and you see the effects of the dense gas on the orbit of the satellite galaxies in this group, or in more massive clusters. Again, two other examples from one of our simulation of Virgo-like clusters with a um, stellar mass density projection. Now, the systems realized and simulated by current state-of-the-art cosmological models are not only beautiful, but they're also uh, reasonably consistent to varying degrees with observational facts. I'm going to really focus on three facts that are relevant for the topics of today. First, simulations like TNG return approximately the trends, the evolution of the, in time a cosmic epoch of the cosmic star formation rate density. Here, the curves are simulations. The great data points are observational inferences, where you can notice the peak of star formation rate density in the universe at our cosmic noon, Redshift 2 or 3, and a subsequent decline. However, this is a bit, um, in some projects, is actually partially by construction, but it's not at all by construction that these kind of simulations all naturally return a star forming main sequence and actually predict a star forming main sequence all the way to very high redshift. In these plots, you're seeing global star formation rate versus galaxy stellar mass at different redshifts. And observations and simulations agree that the higher the stellar mass of a galaxy, the higher the star formation rate values if it's star forming, the higher the redshift, the higher is the locus of the star forming main sequence. Three, simulations of this type successfully return two distinct classes of galaxies. Actually, we have seen them earlier, um, star-forming galaxies on the star-forming main sequence and galaxies that fall off from the main sequence, or you can see them here as blue versus red galaxy in the G-R minus versus stellar mass colors. The distributions here repre the represent number density of galaxies. In black is observational data from SDSS. In blue is the result of one of our simulation, TNG 100. Both observations and simulations agree. They say below 10 to the 10 solar masses in stars, galaxies are mostly blue. Above it, they're mostly red. Or in other terms, in terms of the quench fraction, the number of galaxies that are, have star formation rate one dex or below the star forming main sequence, or they are red in, the, uh, in some color color diagram, you can see the quench fraction versus galaxy stellar mass, while well, observations and simulations agree that it is a function of galaxy stellar mass. And again, below 10 to the 10 solar masses in stars, galaxies are mostly star forming. The quench fraction is very low. And otherwise, above 10 to the 11, galaxies are mostly quenched. And you may be noticing here the difference in quench fraction at the high mass end between two simulations, the old illustrious and the new TNG. And this is due to different implementation of supermassive black hole feedback. Finally, 
the simulations also return the zeroth order connections between uh, star formation activity and stellar morphologies, with uh, blue star forming simulated galaxies also exhibiting in the simulation disk like structures with spiral arms and bars and beautiful things, as well as red quiescent galaxies with more stellar cocoon of elliptical uh, distribution of light. So, equipped with these uh, rich and uh, reasonably realistic models, we can actually use them to get some insights together with observations on how star formation, but in fact also its decline, its quenching, unfold across time and across galaxy populations. If you're not of this field, the next two slides really give you a zero order picture of where we stand. As I shown you earlier, the star formation activity of galaxies depends on their galaxy stellar mass. But in fact, observations and simulations agree that it also depends on their environment. A fixed galaxy stellar mass, galaxies that reside in higher density environments typically have lower star formation rates than their equivalently similarly massive galaxies in low density environments. In a lambda colder matter model, and from a theoretical perspective, this is all related to the underlying mass of the Darmate halo. And it depends on whether a galaxy is a central of its own Darmate halo and gaseous halo, or whether a galaxy of the same mass, say, is a satellite that orbits around a more massive central, and therefore orbits in the gaseous and Darmate halo of a much more massive host than the one it would have for its own mass. More generally, the star formation activity of galaxies depends on the interplay between internal and environmental processes. Now, again, very generally, um, simulations and some observations um, confirm that whether galaxies are star forming or quenched is correlated to their amount of gas, to the availability of gas. And this makes total sense, right? Gas is the fuel for star formation. So, to zero order, you can imagine that galaxies that are quenched must have undergone some process that have either removed or made them lose their gas in comparison to similarly massive galaxies that are still star forming. In fact, according to simulations, two are the chief processes that determine whether galaxies are star forming or quenched. Supermassive black hole feedback, and on the side of the environment, gas tripping. So we're gonna start with the supermassive black hole feedback, and I cannot be more emphatic here. Within the boundary conditions of large cosmological simulations of large samples of galaxies, no mechanism other than feedback from supermassive black hole have been shown to be able to quench entire populations of massive galaxies to the levels consistent with observations. M mergers, morphological quenching may quench some galaxies, but not all of them, otherwise we would have caught them. And by supermassive black hole feedback, I mean energy, momentum, or mass exchange source from the innermost regions of galaxies and energetic enough as the energy that is available from supermassive black hole growth. I'm going to demonstrate this claim based on TNG. Again, this is a color galaxy stellar mass plot, and you see two sets of galaxies simulated. In red, they are from the TNG fiducial model. In blue, are from the model, the same model, but with switched off AGN supermassive black hole feedback. A red quiescent population of high mass galaxies develop only when supermassive black hole feedback is on. And this is a general feature of all successfully realistic cosmological simulations of galaxies. In particular, in our TNG model, this supermassive black hole feedback is the one that is in low accretion rates, radiatively inefficient kinetic mode. In practice, to give you a bit more of an idea, we implement this in a subgrid fashion by invoking either high-velocity accretion disk winds of the black hole or small-scale jets. Really, this is a scheme that shows you the idea on a very zoom-in version of a galaxy. Energy from supermassive black hole is donated to the surrounding gas cells uh, as kinetic kicks in different directions at different time steps of the black hole and in a pulsated manner so that as a function of uh, average in time is an isotropic injection. But this, in the lower right part of the slide, is what we implement at the subgrid level, at the injection scales of a few hundred parsecs. And this is what comes out when you actually run simulation with this model. 
from left to right is gas velocity, gas temperature, gas density, and gas metallicity. Supermassive black hole driven winds trigger outflows of gas at large scales of 1,000 kilometers a second that shock hits the gas in and around galaxies, creating low density bubbles below and above galaxy disk of highly enriched uh, gas. Four more points I want you to take home. The same feedback mechanism is both ejective and preventative. It's ejective in the sense that it's trigger quenching by removing gas from the star forming region of galaxies. It's preventative in the sense that the uh, shocks actually uh, thermalize the mm, convert kinetic energy in thermal, uh, in thermal energy, and they offset the cooling time of the gas around galaxies that could potentially in future um, uh, um, cool down to make star formation. And this objective nature of the quenching mechanism is typical also of other successful simulation projects like EGO. But on the other hand, there are two other points I want you to see. The effects of supermassive black hole feedbacks extend to spatial scales that are much larger than the energy injections in which the um, supermassive black holes uh, live. And the supermassive black hole driven outflows and the effects are not isotropic, even though the, en the in energy is injected isotropically. So, TNG postulates an inside out quenching of galaxies. These are maps of stacked galaxies, massive ones, in SSFR, so specific star formation rate, star formation rate divided by stellar mass, of galaxies below, on, and above the star forming main sequence. And the supermassive black hole feedback by ejecting gas from the middle also create this hole in the star formation maps. This inside out quenching is actually consistent with observations with 3D HST data. Now the plots are showing you um, SSFR radial profiles. And again, you can see on the left panel that galaxies that are quenched show a depression in the center, in star formation rate in the central regions, both in the observed galaxies, the black curve, as well in the simulation TNG50 galaxy in the pink curve, but not in other simulations with very different implementation of supermassive black hole feedback, like the old one, Illustris. Oopsie. <clears throat> so, this hole is actually reminiscent of the hole that Adam flashed at the end of the talk uh, about one of the galaxies in the local universe. However, the phenomenology here is really a redshift one. Um, and whether, and TNG actually um, predicts um, holes in the gas and the star forming regions of galaxies in the inner regions, also a low redshift. But whether this is quantitatively consistent or not with observations needs to be checked. Perhaps in G in the next talk we'll talk about a little bit more. But let's turn into uh, low mass galaxies and environmental effects. Um, so, I told you that low mass galaxies are typically star forming. Well, unless they are satellites or more massive hosts. Again, quench fractions versus galaxy stellar mass. Now on the left are central galaxies only, and on the right are satellite galaxies only. The quench fractions go from 5%, 10% to 40%, and actually not shown here, even 80, 90% of 10 to the 10 solar mass galaxies, they live in 10 to the 15 solar mass clusters. Also, people have seen that uh, satellite galaxies have lower level of H1, but also have more spheroidal stellar morphologies. And both morphology and star formation activity are, of course, all correlated, connected with their uh, availability of gas. So, as satellites plunge in the intra-halo gas, in the halo gas around their central, they undergo these environmental processes. They undergo gas removal because of stripping. And according to our simulations, the most striking and most important phenomenon is ramp pressure stripping, which makes jellyfish galaxies. Jellyfish galaxies have been observed. You see it on the left in, in um, H1, H alpha, in X-ray. On the right, you see stems from our simulations in all gas. And you can see that in some cases, the galaxies are plunging at supersonic speeds and, and essentially punch the intra-group or intra-cluster gas, producing even bow shocks, as you can see in the lower right. We have visually inspected thousands of our galaxies, and we have actually put tens of thousands of images of um, TNG galaxies on the universe, and now we have a few thousand jellyfish examples to study. And one cute example, a cute result I want to point out is that 
while room pressure stripping remove gas from these galaxies, actually star formation keeps going. And it also keeps going within the run pressure strip tails, albeit to very lower levels. You can see here a jellyfish galaxy in the gas, all gas called not um, ionized or not, and in H alpha. If we plot the star formation rate global again versus galaxy stellar mass, we can see actually that some tails, the star formation rates that are even above the star forming incipients of the global TNG 50 galaxies. But generally, we do not find. Uh, a population-wide elevated star formation rate of jellyfish galaxies compared to the um, control galaxies, as some but not all observations are, are, are pointing out. And therefore, this gives uh, uh, food for thought for more uh, checks and studies. I'm going to conclude the talk with uh, the cherry on the cake that really brings together most of the concepts uh, we have discussed. Thanks to the last TNG simulations, we have found actually a new phenomena in real galaxy data, in fact, in SDSS. So now imagine a, centra, a massive galaxy uh, in the sky. It sits at the center of its massive gaseous and matter halo, surrounded by some satellite galaxies. Now, because thanks to the photometry, we can get the position angle of the central galaxy, and therefore we can define a minor major axis direction in the sky. We have found that the star formation of satellites depends on the, their angular location with respect to the, their central. Meaning that in SDSS data, the fraction of quench galaxy, that are satellites, is lower along the minor axis of their central. The amplitude of this phenomenon is present also in TNG. Here in green, compared to SDSS data, renormalized. It's a small phenomenon of the order of the percentage point, but it's statistically significant. And on top of that, in SDSS data, this angular modulation is stronger for satellites closer to their center, lower mass satellites, more massive centrals, um, and halos with relatively more massive supermassive black holes. We call this an isotropic satellite quenching, and we think that this is a manifestation of the interplay between um, satellite galaxies and the circumgalactic gas of their central, which in turn is affected by the supermassive black hole at the center of their central. So again, say supermassive black holes occurs lower density region in the halo gas around its galaxy. Lower density means lower run pressure stripping, but lower run pressure stripping means lower, less gas removal along the orbit of satellites, and therefore a relatively less efficient quenching. If the effects of feedback, if number one is anisotropic, then you get an angular modulation. And in TNG, I mentioned it before, feedback are anisotropic. We think that this is a the quintessential manifestation of the far-reaching effects of supermassive black hole feedback. But it's indirect because it affects the satellite galaxy's population. But still, in our interpretation, it relies on this prediction from TNG that supermassive black hole feedback makes the circumgalactic medium at hundreds of kiloparsec scales modulated in angle. I finish with edge-on stacks of massive galaxies gas density, gas temperature, gas metallicity of the circumgalactic halo gas normalized by the azimuthal average uh, of the property. And you can see that supermassive black hole feedback, at least in TNG, produces lower density, but higher de temperature and higher metallicity along the galaxy's minor axis where the supermassive black hole is functioning. We think this is going to be uh, provable with X-ray observations of the circumgalactic medium, and we are looking forward to more and deeper data with Erosita. I summarize here my highlights. One, star formation and its uh, decline or quenching mechanisms can actually happen simultaneously within the same galaxies in different parts of their bodies. This anisotropic satellite quenching is a new phenomenon in SDSS data, and maybe really the proof of uh, the far-reaching effects of supermassive black hole feedback. But I would like to close by echoing the message of this, um, the motto of this uh, assembly um, with simulations for all. In fact, uh, our illustrious and illustrious TNG data is fully, completely available on our website, and it's ready for you to use for research, teaching, or outreach.
Thank you very much for this um, overview of all the exciting results coming out of simulations. Um, there's time for one quick question. Yes, please. Sorry, I was a bit far. <laughs> uh, thank you, this was impressive, a very interesting talk. I was wondering, because since you can resolve galaxies and you showed some galaxies that you can even see some bars, if with the illustrious you have some bar fraction prediction with redshift or something like this. Oh, yes, uh, so we have certainly have at least four or five papers on, on bars in um, disk-like galaxies across the mass range and also across redshift. I pointed to a paper by, um, um, is that not coming to my mind? But yes, actually, as soon as disk forms, bars form. And this as high as redshift two and three. Yetli Rosas Guevara is the person of the paper. Okay. Um. I think if you would like to have more questions to Annalisa, try to catch her after the session or in the coffee break. So let's thank her again. Thanks for the patience. So this brings us to the last talk of this session. It's by Yinji Peng from the Kathleen Institute um, at Beijing University. Um, Yinji obtained his PhD at the ETH, similar um, to Annalisa. Actually, they were office mates. For his PhD, he was awarded the ETH medal, and he started basically studying um, star formation quenching and, um, and, and its impact on the stellar mass functions, where he has a very highly influential paper from 2010. This theme has continued throughout his career. He was um, he moved on after his PhD to a postdoc in Cambridge, and after that he immediately moved to the current position. He also obtained the Merrick Fellowship from the European Astronomical Society, as well as a national award for Science Fund Award in 2021. So, now we will basically hear the observational evidence of the simulations um, with predictions that Annalisa presented us. So I hope um, Jinri is online because it's a remote talk. He couldn't unfortunately be able to join us. So could you please bring up the speaker? Many thanks, Eva. Many thanks for the okay. introduction. And I'm really grateful to, for having this opportunity to, uh, to give this talk. And I may apologize for not being able to join this wonderful event in person. Uh, that's, that's a shame, that's uh, too bad. So uh, today my talk is about um, exploring the star formation and quenching. Basically the star formation rate uh, density uh, raise both observations and simulations by linking them, comparing them, and find what's a success uh, and also what's a failure. So um, here is my um, um, collaborations, uh, my, my group members. <coughs> So I think this uh, linear metal plot is one of the best plot dis to describe the central topic of this um, uh, uh, symposium of the galaxies, uh, the rise, uh, rise and fall of the star formation rate density. So um, we want to understand what the drivers behind this um, cosmic star formation rate. Um, so I think there's three important things. Uh, first, this is an um, SS bar specific star formation rate as function of redshift. Uh, I call it cosmic clock, and I will show later why uh, why I call it um, cosmic clock. And the second one is um, star formation and also crunching. And the third one is margin. I think these three processes are very important, and both uh, putting them together, they shaping uh, they shaping what um, um, the star formation rate density looks like. Okay, these three things also determines another important um, uh, fundamental property is the stellar mass function evolution. So basically, uh, the stock measure with the density uh, evolution and the stellar mass function, they are closely correlated. And they're both dri driven um, by the three things, uh, merging you know, cosmic star formation and uh, the cosmic clock and crunching and also merging. So the next question is to ask what drive the SSR evolution and what drive crunching and merging? I think um, uh, that's quite um, a big, big, big topic, but uh, in my mind, there are gas density and the galactic clock, which is named by the Tarconi et al. Uh, so basically, galactic clock is a star formation efficiency or the gas division time scale. And another one we propose is angular momentum history. So the angular momentum of gas is also very important um, to determine. <laughs>
uh, it's very important. Uh, it's very important to determine the growth of the disk and also crunching. And another one is, um, uh, and, and Anissa this shall, um, introduced agent feedback and also should probably feedback at a low uh, mission. So uh, probably all the all the things are determined eventually by the growth of the dark matter halos. So in my talk, I will first introduce the three things, the cosmic clock and the crunching and merging, then I will focus on, um, on the crunching. So um, the specific stock formation rate. So um, this um, this plot shows the y-axis is specific stock formation rate, stock formation rate derived by the standard mass of function of redshift. So this is the data point. And the green sort line, this line is the um, specific accuracy rate of the documented halos. Uh, the dash of green lines is two times uh, two times um, 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 this specific stock uh, specific uh, documented accuracy rate. So the dash line is normally the predictions of the semi analytic models and hydro simulations and other gas um, regulation models. The roughly uh, the, the fall of this dash line, and this trend basically is driven by the fact that uh, uh, the the evolution of the bions and dark code, uh, code dark matter uh, dark matters. We have this code evolution, and um, in this paper, we uh, we find that all the existing models um, can fully reproduce observed SSR. Um, um, mostly happen at Russia two, uh, the peak of the stock formation rate. And this is a recent papers, uh, very nice papers, uh, putting together the recent uh, observations. As you can see, uh, this is the data and the simulations and um, of the, this green line, this is air galaxies, semi analytic models, and then you have the TNG, and, and, and also you have the eco simulations. So basically, the simulations that I mentioned here is basically follow this dash green lines. So you can see uh, this is roughly still the same, um, the same, the same trend. But still, the general trend is no problem. But in, if you're looking at the details, you still have this um, uh, deficient um, in the specific stock formation rate at Russia 2. So in this paper, they conclude, um, well, the, the general trend is, 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 is the same, but still have large discrepancy with uh, respect to observations. So um, the, the question to ask is that, uh, is this difference, um, it, 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 uh, is fine or not? So um, we, when we're looking at the build of the stars, um, this is the definition of the SSR, and you can calculate the, the standard mass by integrate the SSR, and so, uh, we do the simple experiment. Uh, I show two specific stock mission with history here. Uh, they differ by only factor two. Then we integrate the SS4 and to see how the standard mass grows. Well, even this SS4 differs by factor only two, but um, the standard mass can differ by 3,000 um, after, after at the end of the at Russia zero. So uh, the cosmic, that's why I call them SS4 is a cosmic clock because eventually the SSR determines the clock um, of the, or most all the evolution, including the main sequence and SSR and co cosmic stock ratio or density and um, metal enrichment and the crunching history. So basically it's like one gig years evolution at Russia three is equivalent to almost 20 gig years evolution at Russia zero. Uh, so evolution at Russia, um, a high Russia is much faster than in the local universe. So indeed, the SS4 is very important, one of the most uh, um, important uh, quantities controlling the, the global evolution speed of the universe. So the next one is the merger rate. So um, in this paper, the recent paper shows the volume uh, average merger rate. So you see the shape uh, is mimic the cosmic stop mission rate density. It's also a rise and fall. Also, the uncertainty is huge because of in observations to, to, to um, um, observe the merger rate is a very difficult thing. So you also need to um, incorporate the merging time scales from simulations section uh, to convert the pairs fraction into the merger rate. So uncertainty is huge, but still um, the general shape is, looks like the cosmic star formation with history. Um, um, they decompose into the merger, major merger rate and also the minor merger rate. But the conclusion uh, of this paper, they find when comparing to the models, um, semi analytic models, and also hydro simulations, they find the accuracy rate of the mass due to mergers is about five times lower than the model um, compared to the observations. So, the, this they conclude suggesting a mismatch between observation and the series in this fundamental aspect. 
Well, about the mergers, there's another uh, important thing I want to mention is the fenton slope with the mass function, uh, the fenton slope with the main sequence, uh, the slope with the main sequence and, and also merging. So uh, because we find the opening observation, the fenton slope with the standard mass function is quite constant from high ratio to zero. There might be some, some um, evolution, mu to evolution. Another thing, um, the fact is the slope with the main sequence is subunity, uh, which means the low galaxies have higher specific star formation rates than the massive galaxies, which will cause a rapid uh, um, uh, steepening uh, with the mass function. This mass function slope, the fenton slope, will get steepened with time very fast. So the solution is the way I argue is that the problem is the only solution. You have to minor merger the low mass galaxies that put them into the mass event to control, to keep the mass, uh, the fenton slope with the mass function about constant. Otherwise, it will steepen with time very fast. So all the three things seems quite separate things, uh, but they are closely, are very closely correlated. So the next one is crunching. Why the crunching is in, also important in shaping the cosmic star formation rate density? Well, the exponential increase at high ratio uh, is, I think, is due to the SS bar at high ratio uh, beyond ratio two is is quite high. So you have this kind of exponential increasing uh, in the FARB, but after ratio two, it start to decrease fast. And this one is one uh, one part is um, one contribution is due to the SS bar of the star forming galaxies is also drop uh, quite fast with time. Another one is crunching, because crunching, you just remove galaxy from the main sequence and down to the passive sequence. So makes the contribution to very small. So in this paper, um, obviously within these papers, she argue um, the crunching must be very important in the dominance of crunching through the cosmic time. And this one can also be seen, I uh, mean, here is a soft masonry standard mass main sequence and the passive sequence. This is for all galaxies, and this is for uh, only central galaxies. So the central galaxies do not have this environment, uh, environment crunch galaxies. It's on, only the so-called mass crunch um, uh, galaxies. But this plot, we just um, weighted the y-axis, the number uh, weighted by the stellar mass. So uh, you can see this, um, the predominance, uh, the peak uh, of the mass crunched galaxies in stellar mass. So the majority of the stars in the local universe actually reside in the mass crunch galaxies. So the mass crunching must be very important in shaping the uh, cosmic star formation density. So the uh, SSRD history basically is also the crunching history. So um, if we want to understand the rise and fall of the uh, star forming, cosmic star formation history, we need also to understand the crunching history. So uh, when comparing with the simulations to uh, observations uh, here um, in this paper, they show the crunch fraction as a function of stellar mass uh, in the old, uh, in the old, this is the old illustrial, and this is a new, uh, the TNG. And you can see uh, when you change, uh, as Anissa mentioned, you've changed the feedback models. It have quite important um, uh, outcomes of the crunch fraction. Uh, this is for the centrals and this is for the satellites. And this is for the observation in the local universe. So as you can see, for the central galaxies, this, this observed will still have some um, some some um, difference compared to observa uh, simulations. Also, um, the satellites have some overcrunching problems in simulations compared to the uh, observations. So uh, we have this um, uh, this simulation in the past decades has have increased and uh, have advanced a lot. It's really become one of the most important tools to understand the universe. But one thing in simulations, when looking at different simulations, they have different recipes, um, very different recipes uh, in um, agent feedback and um, the Shubrovi feedback. But um, most of the simulations um, can reproduce observed standard mass function. Uh, this is sort of by construction because they're using the standard mass function as a calibration um, to, to the uh, parameters. So uh, this shows uh, the air galaxies and TNGs and also EGO, they have similar um, um, well reproduced. Um, mass function up to very high ratio. So this caused some, some I think, uh, some, some potential um, problems uh, because the mass function, as, as I said, it's driven by the three things, crunching history and SS spark history and merging histories. And I have showed in my previous slides, um, when you compare the simulations with the observations, you, have, you still have some difference in both three things, the both the crunching SS bar and the merging history. But eventually the outcome, uh, mass function, they all look similar to the observation. So this highlights some 
fundamental process might, might still be problematic in simulations and also in the semi-dynamic models. Well, on the other hand, um, on the other hand, we still have this um, um, the my um, um, phenomenological models. Um, this um, this models. Uh, um, so in this simulation, this is a just a pure um, visualization. Uh, you first face. Oh, sorry. Um, At high rush, the mass function just involves the mass event until reach the characteristic sector M star. It start to build up vertically. So this trend um, is come when you compare with observations um, in the past ten years, uh, still uh, works uh, quite well, um, even with um, the recent mass function to very high rush. So the dash line. The dash line is a model, uh, and the sort line is a feed to the data. As you in the local universe, in the low redshift, it works very well. At high redshift, uh, it's less well. But if you're looking at the data point, um, with valid data point, still is not not bad. So this this phenomenological approach um, is low physics, but in general agreement with the mass function, as is Fock history, Kunjing history, and uh, merging history. So the question um, I, I want to ask is uh, then what's the, what is mass crunching the physical mechanisms? So here I show again the, the main sequence, the um, star formation rate star mass for central galaxies. And this is a mass functions. As you can see here, uh, the, the solid line is model prediction, is not a fit. Uh, so you can see indeed this phenom phenomenological model works uh, very well as can match with the observation data were most uh, pre uh, precisely, very precisely. And this mass crunch galaxies, they also featured with alpha element in house and also old populations. So when you work throughout the continuity of creations and observe mass functions, you, we can calculate the required mathematical form of the mass crunching rate. Um, There's a crunching probability, which is very simple, star formation rate divided by a constant. Uh, sector M star is constant. So you have higher star formation rate and you have higher probability to be crunched. Uh, that's, that, that's required by the data, required by the mass function uh, evolution. So basically, this is the answers. Uh, I think that this is the mathematical answers, but still, we don't know what's the physics. So the next question uh, is to ask what's the physics um, of this mass crunching? So to explore the mass crunching in the local universe, we have to select some, some uh, very special sample. I call it massive central disk galaxies. Why? Uh, because many ellipticals are formed at high redshift. An internal crunching mechanism not, is normally not predict, um, expected to change the morphology or structure of galaxies because crunching in general is operating on the gas, not uh, operating on the stars. So it cannot, in, in most cases, will not change the orbit of the stars. And also, uh, we choose the central disk uh, is to minimize the effect of mergers and interruptions and to minimize the environmental effect uh, because the gas content, it, in particular, the H1 is very sensitive to environment. So here I show some star forming disk galaxy in the sample and present disk galaxies. When we compare, the next thing is compare the gas content of both the H1 atomic gas and H2 gas as function of star formation rate uh, for this massive galaxies, massive central disk galaxies. So doing this crunching, as we can see, it's quite astonishing. It's like the H1 gas con content is almost constant. Uh, the crunch galaxies or the galaxy in the process of being crunched, they have similar H1 gas content as the star forming ones, but their H2 gas um, decreased uh, rapidly by one dex. And also star formation efficiency of the H2 also decreased uh, one dex. Uh, we also check the dust content. Uh, the dust content um, of the star forming galaxies uh, decreasing very sharply and to the, the intrinsic value of 3.1 uh, for the passive galaxies. So these two are, uh, results are consistent. Then we conclude in the local universe, the massive star forming central disk galaxy are crunched due to strangulation of the H2 surprise. So H2 is being gradually consumed by star formation or being expelled by feedback, let's say agent feedback. A strong, also a strongly suppressed H2 star formation efficiency. So this is strangulation scenario is also consistent with my uh, 2015 papers uh, using the metallicity, static metallicity as an indicator to starting the crunching. Uh, so I think there's a nice um, um, uh, consistency. 
Um, this results uh, is from a single dish antenna, so we do not have a resolution. But we can see uh, this is resolved data, not so many of them, uh, but we can try to try to speculate. Uh, this is the uh, optical uh, stars, and this is H1. So this plot in this um, uh, galaxy is overplot H2, uh, H2 and in red, and H1 in blues. So our scenario basically means when the galaxy gets crunched, you still have a H1 disk uh, in the outside, outer disk uh, is still rotating, but you have the H2 inside uh, in the center of the disk on the stellar disk, then depleted. So if we show the H1 profile of star forming and passive, then it looks very similar. And even for the crunch galaxies, there's a double horn profile integrating, indeed, they have a, a regular rotating H1 disk. So in observations, you still have, you can, um, you can also see this, um, um, some galaxies indeed have the huge H1 disk, but there's no molecule gas inside. So um, the next uh, thing is we also want to look at the structure. So this uh, uh, galaxy is massive central disk galaxy again. Um, when the star formation will decrease, the bar frequency increase from almost 20% to almost 100%. So bars must be very important, no matter as a cause or as an outcomes. And the central velocity dispersion also increased faster, and also bars to disk ratio also increased rapidly. So this, this introduced, uh, this is um, uh, uh, indicating maybe morphological crunching or some gravitational crunching at work. We're also looking at AGM frequency. Um, uh, in the same plot, star formation were decreasing from star forming to passive. Uh, it's quite remarkably, um, the AGM fre frequency increased to almost 100%. So all these quenched central massive disk galaxies, I have AGMs, uh, although they are liners. Uh, liners, we're not asking there's liars or liners, uh, but many recent studies to show the liners, uh, they could be um, genuine low luminosity AGM, low AGMs. So, um, so this observation indicates probably kinematic feedback. Uh, the low accretion mode from massive low luminosity AGN uh, indeed crunch the massive galaxies. So putting together these scenarios, we have these pictures. Uh, um, so you have the gas doing the crunching. Um, you have the, the H2 inside is consumed by gas or deep by the AGN feedback. Then you, when the galaxy gets crunched, you have H1 disk um, outside. And the bars also increase, and the bars increase, and also AGM frequency also increase. The later, you probably still need a major mergers to destroy the H1 disk, to destroy the stellar disk, and transform into the elliptical galaxies. Uh, but still, uh, we need, to, we want to figure out what's the, what's the physical mechanisms. Uh, so we're using simulations. So uh, we compare this this plot observations with the TNG um, simulations, and the gas content H1 and H2. Uh, with this uh, TNG and in this paper, uh, it's quite remarkable. Uh, there is a really re remarkable agreement between the TNG predictions and observations. And and Anissa already mentioned what's the, what's the physical mechanisms or the kinematic mode to crunch galaxies. And we also uh, to show this pictures, these two galaxies in TNG, one star forming and one is passive. And when we look at the gas density profile, um, this is for the star forming ones, and this is for the crunched ones. And this one is in the simulation, the threshold, uh, the minimum gas density threshold to form stars. You must be higher than this um, threshold, then the gas can form stars. So whereas the passive galaxies, indeed, they have a lot of cold gas, but they all below this threshold. This makes uh, quite clear what crunched galaxies in the simulations. By the agent feedback, they just smooth out the high density peaks. And so you have gas, but you do not form stars. I think I, I think I personally I quite like these pictures. Um, um, it's a very nice consistency between simulations and observations. So it's very likely indeed the agent feedback uh, crunching massive galaxies. But somehow we still want to ask the question: Is there any non-agent solutions to crunch massive galaxies? At least some of the uh, massive crunch galaxies. The possible mechanisms could be halo heating, uh, morphological crunching. Bar crunching and the new mechanism we proposed under momentum crunching. Why we need this? Because there's still in observations, some galaxies, the pure disk galaxies, got crunched. The central galaxies, they don't have a bars. Um, and also, we know for for many years from the um, literatures, um, in this like from the Abshay Dekos and uh, Joanna Wu's work, 
Uh, the halo seems uh, not important to quench the central galaxies. So this will mostly rule out all these uh, other quenching mechanisms make them uh, the ones uh, attracting the angular momentum quenching. So what's the angular momentum quenching? So um, we're using observed scaling relations at a different redshift, uh, main sequence and size evolutions, and then we can calculate for individual galaxies. If we trace their evolution, what the stellar mass will increase and what the size will increase. And then we can calculate what the angular momentum of the galaxies, of individual galaxies, will change from redshift 2 to redshift 1. As you can see, the increase is quite huge, uh, could be up to a uh, factor 100. So the rapid growth of the angular momentum requires the angular momentum of the infolding gas uh, must be aligned. So the gas in so the, um, the inflowing gas fuel in star formation and disk growth must also secular increase with time. And the star formation in the disk can seize or quench once the accurate materials, uh, many in the H1, uh, comes in with the exist, uh, excessive uh, angular momentum to sustain adequate radial inflows of the cold H2, uh, basically the strangulation. It will cause the strangulation. So um, this is also consistent with the, the, the observation we find the quenched disk galaxies, they have a huge H1 disk, uh, but there's no H2. Uh, this could be because angular momentum is too high. And so the gas without perturbations is very difficult for the gas to flow into the center to, to form stars. So this, this picture is also later actually observed in simulations in TNG. So in, in, the, in this TNG papers, they conclude uh, present day crunch galaxies indeed uh, the, um, the ambient, uh, ambient CGM have much higher angular momentum. So um, a sufficient high secular uh, angular momentum could be very important in determining um, galaxy crunching uh, in TNG in the simulations. So um, I'm finishing. Uh, so um, I want to I want to this, this I, I code I, I code this sentence from the Astro 2020 is like the I think in the um, from now and in the future, if we want to understand the, the really complicated ecosystem, we need to combine theories and um, simulations and observations together. So all of them are very really important. Okay, um, I will stop here and, and, and take questions. And thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for presentations. Are there questions in the room? Um, I don't see any, and I also don't. There's a question online from Dana Ficut Vigas, and according to the literature, bars can be transient features of galaxies. How is that taken into account when calculating the bar spectrum? Oh, I assume that might be a question to Annalisa or to Jinji. Um. Ah. Okay, I think there's a question from Barbara Catinella. Um, it says, thanks Jinji for your talk. You mentioned that central massive and passive galaxies have similar H1 content to star forming systems. As you know, we do not find such a population in X gas and showed that the issue in Sloan star formation rates underestimating true values for galaxies with extended star forming disks. Can you comment on this? Oh, yes. Um, let me have this night. Um, uh, just a minute, let me try to find a slide. The star formation rate does matter. So in actually in our uh, let me try to find this slide. I have this oh, slide. Maybe try to answer without. I do have, um, okay, here. Yeah. Oh, I stopped the sharing or? Yes, yes, please just answer. Oh, sorry. Um, let me, okay. Okay, so in this plot, um, in this plot, well, we show the both the stock mission rate um, indicators. Um, the upper row is for the uh, HR file, the, low, um, the lower row is for the UV plus infrared. So we show um, um, the same plot for the gas content, H1 and H2, um, H1 and H2, and also bar frequency and HM frequency. So you see the trend uh, for both stock mission rate indicator are exactly the same. 
are exactly the same, but the absolute value of the stock formation rates indeed are different. So for the HR alpha stock formation rates, uh, you call this galaxy called crunch galaxies, but for UV or plus infrared stock formation rate, we call them galaxy in the process of being crunched. But the problem is, as I said, uh, the trends are the same. And the most importantly, even for the UV plus infrared galaxies, uh, the stock formation rate indicators, the H1 gas content have dropped one dex, uh, have dropped over one dex. Well, for these galaxies, the, the, the stock formation rate might not be that low um, if you're using UV plus infrared, but still the molecule gas to the H1 gas ratio is really low. And these galaxies that do not think they can keep forming stars, they will be crunched quite soon because of the really low H2 gas content. And also you can see the bar frequency and AGM frequency. So all these trends are very similar. And another thing that uh, uh, um, 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 important, I think, is how to define the disk galaxies. We're using morphology visual select um, disk galaxies, which is very different from the, if you select the defined disk galaxies as the BT selected or the other um, by the structures, uh, because, um, because in our, uh, in, because the, we show the disk galaxies and uh, crunchy disk galaxies, some of them have very massive barge. So if you uh, if you use um, BT or search index to define disk, they will be counting to elliptical and vice versa. So, but anyway, I think I, I, I think the most important thing is the trend, uh, the trend uh, H1 or the H2 to H1 ratio. Um, that that is quite clear from this plot. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I see people are starting to moving in for the group picture. There's one time for a quick question in from the audience, and then over there. Hi, I wanted to ask is, uh, if minor mergers can reignite uh, star formation in this passive and massive uh, uh, disk galaxies. Like any minor interaction can uh, start the star formation. Yeah. This the sound is very uh, is very small. So so is your question uh, is minor mergers how the minor mergers contribute to the star formation? In a in a already transitioning uh, galaxy like a, maybe a green valley or a massive galaxy disk. Yes, from um, I think from the um, the minor mergers could be um, quite could, could be quite important. And I'm trying. No, please just answer. Hmm. Um, well, let me find this thought. Uh, um, Jinji, can you please just answer? I think um, otherwise, I, th I would also suggest that you come coordinate on, on the Slack, either the 373 Slack or the IAU 2020. Because from observations, you can the minor mergers they can contribute about to thirty percent of the of the of the mass increase. Um, like in this papers, I think the 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 Sun Black Sun Nine this is a major mergers, and then uh, this Dash Nine is a minor mergers, and so so um, they also calculate what's the final contribution. I see. I remember. I think the minor merger contributes still of thirty percent of the mass accretion. So the minor mergers, indeed, they are very important in shaping the structures and the morphologies and also the size evolutions. But for, for the stock formation, and they could be also quite important, not negligible. Thank you. Okay. So thank you. Um, let's thank all the speakers again. Thank you very much.